to see so so many of you that have made time in your day to come and actually learn about millennial philanthropy and just our, our work in general in the nonprofit space. It's great for us to be able to get together. And we have a, a terrific topic and even better speaker uh, lined up for you today. So really excited that you're with us. Um, next. For those of you, one, we saw we had a huge number of people register. So we're excited about that because they're coming from all over. Uh, we have some very familiar faces that we like to welcome back, but we also have some folks that we know are new to us. So we like to, to let you know just a little bit about our center. Uh, we have been around since 2017 in the Bush School. We are housed in the, the massive Texas A&M University in the Bush School of Government and Public Service, uh, which makes it really nice because we don't have to look for taglines about why we do the work we do. Uh, we have a lot of quotes from, from President and Mrs. Bush about why service is important. Um, so you can see with our work at the center, we try to support a vibrant nonprofit and philanthropic sector in Texas and beyond, which is perfect for today because we have people from, from all over. Um, but what, the way we do that is really by providing research. Uh, we are doing more and more research. Uh, we also have professional outreach and um, our engaged learning. And that really looks like capacity building and continuing education. So we have a lot of different ways that, that we can reach out and um, into our communities and learn more about what's happening and philanthropy on the ground. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, uh, we have some contact information at the end, but uh, primarily we have our Master of Public Service Administration where you can concentrate in nonprofit. Uh, we also have um, an executive master, so you can do that online, but a graduate certificate um, in nonprofit management. And now we have some continuing ed. So we're trying to, to reach people at various points in their careers to try and help them do the work they want to do in, in nonprofits. So with that, um, let's go ahead and advance and let me introduce our speaker. We don't want to waste time uh, I'm talking about logistics. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So today we are pleased to have Dr. Holly uh, Miori with us. You notice that not only does she have her PhD, but she also has an MPA and MTS. So she studied public affairs, she studied theology, um, and has the, her fundraising certification. So one way that I like to think about this is what she's doing is um, she's working as an academic, a researcher, but also a fundraising professional. She has over 20 years in fundraising. And so what she's what I like to call a pracademic, right? So she's somebody who's actually doing the work. So when she's doing research, she's asking really relevant questions and the, the work and the research complement each other very well. So that's something that I'm excited about um, being able to learn like her perspective because she's doing this in the field every day. Currently, she is the Senior Director of Development uh, at the Harry Bass Junior School of Arts, Humanities and Technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. So that keeps her busy. But in addition to that, she's been sharing this research. She's essentially in a book tour, um, taking her doctoral research that, that she's turned into a book for all of us and, and synthesized everything that she's really learned about millennials. Um, she's taking that around the country uh, and still finds time to be active with the Association of Fundraising Professionals at both local chapter and um, at the national level, focusing on government relations, in addition to her local um, personal interest with Aware Dallas and, and Paper for Water. So those are some things that, that I think give insight to how she thinks about millennials and philanthropy in general. Um, and if you're interested, of course, you can see her, uh, you'll be learning a lot of, of snippets and, and um, points from her book today. But if you're interested, you can always reach out to her to learn more at askdrholly.com. I always like to promote that, but you can get her book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart. She's pretty much everywhere with it right now. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into our conversation next. So I mentioned her, she's turned her research into a book and it's Millennial Philanthropy. And you see this right on the, the right side of your slide. It's understanding next generation fund development for professionals and nonprofits. It's trying to help us figure out how we're working with this next generation, because why do we focus on millennials? You know, and there are a couple of reasons. One, we know that philanthropy shifts and it shifts because of the people who are currently engaged in giving. Right. Uh, that's why, you know, we see changes in giving and it's why the 
things like the and reports from the fundraising effectiveness um, project and giving USA reports. It's why that's helpful, right? It's because we're keeping track quarterly, um, annually on different giving trends. The other thing is that we're it's time for us to start thinking about our philanthropy and who we're engaging as prospects a little bit differently, right? So we know it's important to understand the constituents we're working with. That's a, a premise that we all under, we go into any sort of fundraising situation. We understand, have to say, who's our audience? Why do they care about us? But there is something that's shifting right now, right? The millennial generation is 75 million people. And there are some of us that are old enough on this call to remember the millennials were just coming into the workforce. But as Dr. Holly and I were talking the other day, she reminded me that they're the, the most elder millennials are becoming grandparents now. So what's happened is you know, the millennials are reaching that stage in life where they're our primary prospects when we're thinking about board members um, engaging donors. It's, they're not, they're no longer our young professional group and our $50 annual fund folks that we're introducing to philanthropy. They're moving into a different role. They're also going to have a tremendous amount of influence over the wealth transfer that's about to happen. So with that, that really helps us understand, I think, why um, they are, are taking a very special place in our fundraising strategy as we move forward. And with that, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to, to you know, Dr. Miori and let her um, go ahead and lead our discussion. We will be taking questions in the chat. So if you have those, please go ahead and you know enter them. And there, we have Alyssa from our Center for Nonprofit staff. She and I will be watching that and we'll try and interject questions as we go along. And we're gonna leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end too. So wow. Holly, would you like to take over? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, it's always a treat to see Dr. Seaworth. Um, we have been um, friends and colleagues through the industry um, for a long time. So it's always great. And it's always grateful to be with uh, Texas A&M. I am married to an Aggie. Um, so um, even though I work in the UT system, it's not a rivalry um, for our house um, to be with Texas A&M. So um, always love. Uh, and I am i don't know if I'm allowed to say whoop, but I will say it um, with my husband and my sister-in-law both being Aggies. So um, with and having a kid going to college, hopefully here in the next couple of years. So A&M's on our list to go take a look. So, uh, well, thank you so much. We're going to talk about millennials. Are they more than avocado toast and lattes? This is the question. Am I going to take care of your interns? We, I used to get this question a lot now, but they're getting about to be about 43 years old, 23 to 43 years old. So they're a little outside the, even the intern age. Um, let's get started. We're going to learn about millennials and who they are, discuss if they're worth a nonprofit time. Um, we know that nonprofits take about 10% of the, of the workforce. Um, and there are the framework, we're going to do some case studies, some implications, um, and hear directly from the millennials. I've got a couple that I did some deep dives with. And I'm going to do a disclaimer. I'm an elder millennials. So that means I'm an older millennial. We're not going to use the word geriatric millennials. I get that question a lot. Um, we're going to ban that word um, today, but we're going to hear, um, learn a lot about what the millennials are. are. So let's first start talking about, uh, excuse me, while I move a piece of this, um, this over for a second. Um, they're born in 1980 to 99. There's 75 million millennials in the United States. So globally, it's much more, it's a little harder to track. Um, but my research for my dissertation turned into a book, um, was US-based. Um, they spent one trillion, that's with a TR, in 2022. The consumerism is very real. It's very high. So how do we get this consumerism and translate it over to philanthropy? What Bush School's excited about, Texas a and excited about, UT Dallas and their public and nonprofit management program is excited about. And also my day job, right? I am a fundraiser. I had our, our council meeting, like our board meeting. We have several millennials on our council. We announced our fundraising um, as part of our campaign, and we just hit over our $100 million. But how much were the millennials part of it? Things we to think about and track. So you can't talk about millennials with talk, without talking about all the generations, giving that framework. So let's first talk about our oldest still living generation, the silent generation born from 1927 to 45. 
They were part of the Great Depression, um, value stability. They have emergence of white collar jobs, beginning of higher ed. This is when we really, even though we know some higher ed um, is there, but really when we start seeing an emergence of many going in, um, higher, um, a higher trust in government. Millennials don't. Um, there's a big shift in that. This is when we start seeing a large, a lot of the large nonprofits begin to emerge, especially with the Great Depression um, in 33. Um, baby boomers, 1946 to 65. We know the name comes from because of the big booth, uh, big boom of births um, after World War II, monumental events, rock and roll, the Beatles. Everybody wants to always talk about the Beatles, especially um, the donors I work with in this generation, highly, highly motivated. They want to. They want us to work fast, and and why is this taking so long to work on my gift? Um, things of that nature. They give and volunteer as a unit. Here's why I want to talk about that and spotlight this. They want to bring their kids along. They want to bring their grandkids along. Millennials are going to separate from that. They don't care about what their family's doing. Um, the Generation X. If you're a Generation X on this call. I'm really sorry. Um, here's why. There was very little research compared to other generations. Um, it's really funny. There's if, if you look at psychology, sociology, marketing, they just don't care about this generation. Um, it's really funny because I'm also married to a Generation X, so he's very sad about this, um, but it's just part of it. But what we do know is there that MTV generation, this, we start seeing latchkey kids, distrust in elders. We're starting to see this shift in the generations, um, that lost generation. We start to see a, this work-life balance, um, self-career development, distrust of leadership, and most likely to own a business. This is really funny. Um, I gave this talk before to a nonprofit and worked with their whole board and did a workshop for them for two days. And every single one is in Generation X. Every single one owned a business. <laughs> A huge group of them. So it's just really funny that this is kind of a trend that's coming out of Generation X. Now, millennials, we're going to deep dive, so I'll go quickly through it um, just for this. They're very tech savvy, digital natives, Oregon Trail generation, very narcissistic. Um, and so we see this a lot. Entrepreneurs that comes um, from their generation above them, um, they have a distrust of larger institutions. This is not good if you work in the UT system, a and and we're trying to fundraise from this generation. Social net, right, network with their, with their friends. We, this comes out of the Facebook generation and other um, big social media. Religion is no longer the guiding star. We used to say, especially out of the fundraising school and Lily, that religion was the number one indicator of giving. It's now gone. And so now we have to think about what's the number one indicator I found it through my dissertation, and we're going to talk through that. Um, and then we want to talk about global issues, local impact. We're going to find a little bit more about through the case study. Gen Z, they're born 2000 to 2011. They're engaging with their parents. Not surprised. They're still probably at home, very tech savvy, being part of the solution. So if you work for a nonprofit and they say, we're going to eradicate homelessness, they're going to go, no, but we're going to also want you to really think about the percentage of how we're going to handle that. Maybe you can reduce it by, you know, 40%, 30%. Alpha, there's not much out there. They're still being born and that's okay. So we're going to keep an eye on that, um, especially my research, because I really like to keep up with that. So let's d do a deep dive into our millennials. They remember the dial-up, especially our elders, the dial-up. Um, Post 9-11, every generation is really indicative of two things, major events, and technology, and then how those generations are defined. They graduated during the Great Recession, especially our older ones, that 07, 08 crisis. They're highly, highly educated, especially our older ones because they went back into graduate school. Um, universities like UT System and a and System loved this because they came back in instead of going getting their bachelors. The, star, the largest student loan debt so for our millennials, originally when I started the research, it was 15,000. I was doing some additional research and we're seeing it's about 30,000, but their income is getting higher because they're the very highly educated and they're getting older. They're having time to go into these bigger jobs, more racially diverse and racially tolerant. Let me put a spotlight on this. One in one in three is two races. One in three, excuse me, one in six are three races. So when we're seeing this, we need to be thinking about our marketing for our nonprofits. Do you represent 
who you're trying to attract and who you serve. Now, obviously, if you're a Hispanically serving institution, for example, you may only have one demographic that you look like, but do you represent who you serve? Where I'm at, UT Dallas, we have more than 100 countries represented. We have to be careful and sensitive to what we represent. So keep, keep and pay attention to what you do. And they're very sensitive to that. So there's two sides of the coin when we think about our friends, the millennials. I originally said the Rubik's Cube, but my publisher said I couldn't do that because we don't own the rights to the Rubik's Cube. So we'll use the two, so excuse me, <clears throat> the two sides of the coin to talk about it. Their one side is kind of this future of philanthropy, providing hope, their most diverse generation. We talked about that. Really, really creative. This really shined through during the pandemic. They were like, we'll do drive-by events. We'll do anything online. We'll stand eight feet apart and talk to each other. They were really, really creative. That real reality check that I was talking about, you can't say as an organization that you're going to eradicate something unless you have a reality check of how it's going to happen. You can reduce something by 40%. You can reduce something by 60%. Um, or you may have a long-term goal of something by 2030, but you cannot, they will have a reality check with you. They're very pragmatic. Um, we talked about that best educated generation. We know this. This is still holding true um, with the great cliff of um, the generations behind it, it's a lot smaller. This is still the largest generation that is still around right now, 75 million. Um, they're focused on the greater good. So when I was doing interviews with millennials, they would talk a lot about this language of the greater good. How can I be part of the greater good? But here's the other side of the coin. They're very overly self-focused. Um, so if we were going to do a back and forth face to face, I, you know, I may say, oh, what do you think about millennials? Oh, they're very narcissistic. I get this a lot. We know this, but it comes with this entrepreneurial spirit that we'd already talked about. They're too involved with technology. That's not surprising. Um, and they're very concerned about that next like on Facebook or so, uh, the other social media, whatever the newest hot thing is. One of the top questions I get asked is, what social media should my nonprofit be involved in? It changes every six months, whatever the hot thing is. And it's also very cultural based on media markets. So I have done this talk in West Coast, East Coast, Mid Midwest, and it's also very um, regionally based. So you have to be very cognizant of what's popular regionally. Um, and then so ask, ask your or um, your millennials what they like. Um, and then that's what you should do. And it also changes in six months. So just pay attention. Um, and so they're taking longer to get married. The average age, and this is held pretty steady um, for years, is the average age is 27 for women, 29 uh, for men. Um, and even with the Marriage Equity Act, that is also still holding true for several years. We're hearing words of like feeling lost or seeming to lack the bigger picture and so they're looking to nonprofits to find purpose, um, or they look for cognitively um, organized organizations to find that purpose. Let me move further. Um, the Giving Guide USA, if you're a student or you're a student of nonprofit, whether you're um, formally in academia or you're in nonprofit, you probably have seen this before, but we know the majority of the money comes from individuals, but how much are actually coming from millennials? We'll pay attention to that. We know that majority of the money goes to religion and human services, then education, and then it goes down from there. Um, then I was trying to really pay attention to where does most of the money go? And then we think of it as thirds, thirds, and thirds. A third of the um, nonprofits uh, are under half a million, then half a million to a million, and then the, the next third is over a million. When you've got a third of the nonprofits and a million plus, and millennials are are don't like these larger institutions, it's really those million plus. So how do we get them excited about the larger organizations? There's a couple ways we'll talk through that. Now, Dr. Seaworth kind of alluded to this, the great transfer of wealth, $65 trillion is going to be estimated to come down by the year 2030. And as I was studying this, I'm like, oh, that's so long from now. It's quickly approaching and it's coming faster and faster. 
15 to $30 trillion is coming um, to the millennials and why the great um, disparity of the number. Two things are happening. The cost of healthcare for our baby boomers and they're living their best lives. My dad is a great example. He's widowed. I'm an only child and he is constantly on the go using up his money. Um, not really as much on healthcare. Um, and so as an only child and he's widowed, that money's going to come down. A couple other things will happen with the CARES 2 Act that was happening during the pandemic. The IRAs are no longer going to be 72 to for if I inherit all the IRAs or whatever millennial is going to be taking them on. Um, they no longer have to be 72. I have to spend it down in 10 years. What nonprofits are my favorite nonprofits right now? Has the has you as a nonprofit already been on the favorite list? We need to be paying really close attention to this. I want you to pay attention to this part. Millennials are already spending money. This data is actually a little out of date to be candid, and we don't have any great national data quite yet. Millennials with the great impact reports, we're saying $481 to $580, um, and then of an annual average giving per year. Um, and then they're also volunteering 40 hours per year. It's not that also the volunteer hours were not too far off um, from some of the other generations. Now, what are the factors that are influencing millennials? Gender, their gender giving behaviors are not are not far off from national trends. Women millennials are giving more. Um, they're and then they want to work and work and work. Excuse me, the work um, is also a big factor. They want that conscious capitalism behavior where they are really paying attention to what. Can they give where they work all at the same time? Do they have days off to go volunteer, things like that? We talked about religion already. Um, religion is no longer a guiding star. Now, are there millennials engaged in religion? Absolutely. But as a national trend, we're talking about, you know, the big numbers. Um, they're they're declining and declining quickly. Um, social justice, we are seeing this and it gets big. And the other thing, since I've been tracking it so long, is that we see things go dramatically up. We saw this with the Millennial Impact Report. We're seeing it again. Um, and we prepare for it during presidential years. So we're expecting social justice to go up during a presidential year. And this also impacts their giving. Their giving will go up dramatically right after the presidential election. No matter what side, doesn't matter what side. Um, relationships, relationships are very important to the millennials, but their peer network is the most important thing to them. It's not their families. They respect the families. Um, economic and political changes, I kind of alluded to that a little bit, um, but these things are really important. They are really impacted by inflation um, as we're seeing right now. So I'm gonna give you a couple case studies and I'll go through them a little faster to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, BBB now. Yes. Um, this is Angela. And I just wanted to touch on the religion piece a bit, because I know we have a lot of faith-based organizations that come to our, to the center and, and look for it. Please. And one of the things that was helpful to me is, and it was instructive, I had a graduate student who was older and had teenagers. As we were talking through this kind of conversation and understanding religion's role, and she gave such a good example. She said her daughter pulled her aside and said, why aren't we giving at church anymore? And she was stunned. She's like, but wait, we do. What do you mean? The difference is with COVID, they started, they, like many people, moved their giving online. That's easier. They didn't change it back. So what's happened is that modeling of everybody passing the basket and putting, you know, collectively giving at the same time, that visual is not there for a lot of people now. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that I think um, can help some people who are working in faith institutions and still um, working with donors that care deeply about religion to help them understand that is that how are we modeling it? And you know, the millennials are in the in that stage of they're going to be modeling philanthropy for their teenagers <laughs> and yeah. you know their kids moving up. So the primary way that many of us, anyone over certainly over 45 um, if you were in a religious household, you saw that modeled constantly and that that's gone now, you know, um, so they, so they're not they're talking giving. about it down. They're not talking right. about it down or they're not giving to the church. They're giving to the parachurch. It's the food pantry attached to the church. It's something mm -hmm. called a parachurch. It's these nonprofits birthed out of churches, um, which is the, the case I actually cut out of this talk. 
<laughs> so oh no, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Um, it's the and they give a lot to the parachurches, so they're maybe not attached to the religion. They're attached to the nonprofit, attached to the religion. Um, and it's it's interesting that we're seeing this shift because they see the good works of the the religion, and they want to see the. So we're seeing this even during the pandemic of um grace and so it's the again it's in the book but i I unfortunately cut it out um it's this great work that they were seeing a lot of them but they don't want to see um the expensive events and all of that they want to see the um down to the mission right don't get into the expensive events go to the mission so we'll see we'll talk a little bit about the bbb side of it which is not a religious organization um it's this it's the shift. It's like while World Vision is doing well, um, Salvation Army, though it's technically a religion, right? It's actually a denomination, um, but it's perceived as a parachurch. Um, you know, Habitat for Humanity um, continues to because it's birthed out of the United Methodist. It's like this whole there. It was almost my dissertation topic, so I have love to talk about this um, in my theology background. And so it's this great work that they're doing, and millennials are very attached to that. And it's that social justice lens that's coming up. Um, that's what they love. So, yeah. Thank so. you for that. I just yeah. thought, I know it's important for, for so many people, and especially in, in Texas um, as a majority, for us to understand how religion does still factor into it. it so thank it's, you. It's different. It's it's there, but it's different, right? Than maybe other older generations, right? So it's it's a shift, but it's still important. Yeah. So I'm happy to jump into this other stuff. Um, and then we can ask answer some more questions at the end. So happy to do that. Okay. Well, let me jump in. So BVB Dallas is what actually started my whole obsession with the idea of millennials. Um, while working here at UT Dallas, I originally started in a neuroscience center and we were partnering with them for a mega gift, a mega, mega gift. And there was the whole idea of why are we partnering with all these millennials? Um, and it is a group formerly known as Blondes versus is brunettes they changed their name they felt that it might have some other um, perceptions so they changed it to just bvb dallas um what they are doing is a powder puff football game and now over the years they also do other events for alternative revenue streams so i'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them so here's some pictures about the organization this is what they do if you if you know much about dallas it's played at the cotton bowl it's a massive stadium they get three thousand people to come and watch the game it's a pay for play so you either have to raise $1,200 or um, give it yourself. Um, and it has grown pretty significantly over the years. It was founded in 2007 by Erin Feingold White. She's the head of marketing and events for, um, I used to say Mark Cuban, but he sold it off the Mavs. Um, in 2007, it has grown very quickly. It was attached to the Alzheimer's Association. But you've heard me talk about really distrust of these large institutions. They got very upset with the Alzheimer's Association and became very localized and created their own 501c3. They wanted to keep the money local. And so they spun off and created their own 501c3. It's grown to 200 participants. They keep pretty steady, even post-pandemic. Um, and then they've raised $7 million. They're hoping to hit that $8 million threshold this summer. I did interviews in 2017 where I asked them about social media, motivations for giving and raising funds, family history with philanthropy, religiosity, history and goals. Went back to them during the pandemic to ask them about COVID-19 impact and social movements like Black Lives Matter. Um, so got to ask those, those things. Here are some things that I heard. They give where they volunteer. They're very tied in and intersected more than probably any other generation. The shifting of the technology. I even had some informal interviews and it was always changing. I love TikTok. TikTok is did. These are direct quotes from the interviews. They're weary of your expensive events. So I talk about this more in depth in the book about they hate your gala. So if you're a nonprofit, I'm really sorry. I, I feel like I'm just on an apology tour nationally about your millennials do not want to go to your gala. They don't want to wear your ball gown. They don't want to wear a tux. Instead, they will go to events though. Um, and they want it where they can really see the money come alive and have, drive back into the mission. 
We talked about that. They don't trust large institutions. Here's the other thing. They don't listen to their parents. Um, every millennial parent just nods their head when I tell this part of it, um, which is really funny. What it is, is that they respect them. I know my parents give philanthropically. What's funny is because I know some of these millennials in the interview set because of my day job. I know that their parents have na buildings named after them. <laughs> I can figure it out. But they don't. Um, they want to pave their own way. We saw this, remember with the baby boomers, where they want everything as a unit, give and, give as a, you know, give and volunteer as a unit, that's gone. They want to, um, they want everything to be on their own. They want their parents to give to their 1200, but they don't want, um, they don't want to do anything their parents do. Um, solve global issues. You hear a lot about all, you know, we want to, we want to demolish Alzheimer's. We want to take care of it, but we want to fund all the local issues here locally. Religion's not a top priority. And I thought maybe this had something to do with just, was it a saturation of who was in the group? Um, it wasn't the case. Um, it seems like, um, here was my biggest surprise in the data set is that they were very offended when other organizations didn't ask them face-to-face -face for an ask whatever that meant. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Social media was really big. Um, they still will actually check on you. So you may say, oh, I want to engage with you and ask face to face, but then they go and use this to check on you. Uh, so social media is still important. They're using it as a fact checker. They want personalization. So they want you to say, Holly, Angela, they want to be called by name and want it to be correct. They want to be treated like a million dollar donor for a thousand dollar gift. But how do we do that? A lot of things have shifted with AI. There's a lot of new technology that we can do to make that happen. We just, as an industry, have really got to get the hang of this to prepare for these millennials. Um, let me talk a little bit more about what happened um, as I did some surveying. I started to get in the weeds with them about, so how much did you personally get, not race, but personally give to BVB? We saw that the members were doing 100 hours, more than the national average. Remember that 40 hours I was talking about? The members are giving 100 hours to the organization, and they have a condensed schedule of just the summer where they do everything. They don't really do much outside summer. They have a season. Um, and then 200 hours for the leadership. So this is kind of like your board equivalent. And they are giving $1,700-ish in 2017, and then it went down pretty dramatically because most of the members were admitting they said, oh, it was the pandemic. I'm giving to the social service organization like a food pantry. I was still giving a lot of money. We were finding members who were giving $20,000 personally. And then I say, oh, do you make $200,000? And they're like, no, I'm giving 20% of my money to the organization. This was a big surprise. It's because they were embedding so much into the organization. So just paying attention to these gener generational giving patterns because they were embedding so much. We were seeing volunteering goes up. This is kind of what we know, um, but it's dramatically more on their giving. You know, again, we talk about the religion question, social justice. We were hearing a lot of language. I was hearing a lot of language about, you know, the social justice lens, especially their grants, especially those were on, uh, on the committee um, engaged with grant making. Family, they respect their family, but they don't, um, but they don't listen to their parents. Um, my dad did not like this part of the slide. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is friends and peers. They get, they got involved with the organization, all 100% involved through their friends. Um, they all got asked mostly face-to-face, -face, a little bit on Bumble, uh, which was a little weird, but um, some other places, uh, but they're all getting involved with face-to-face, -face, asked to be involved with the organization. Social media is still really important. No, that's not a surprise there, um, but the social media changes all the time. Keeping it local. You get to have a global issue, but how do you localize it? Because um, they want to make the impact local. So I want to do a very quick, what's next? Generation Z. That's that next generation, right? They're born 2000 to 2011. Um, I sit on a, paper, a board called Paper for Water. Um, they actually won the AFP Association of Fundraising Professionals Global um, Award a few years ago. They make origami and then sell it. Um, they've been involved with Nickelodeon, United Nations, um, the Neiman Marcus Christmas catalog, which was really fun, by the way, a few years ago. And then 
it has been what is not, it's just not about the two girls that started it, Isabel and Catherine. This is a really old picture of them. They're now going off to college. Um, and Generation Z is now going off to college. We need to recognize that those are now your interns. Um, the thing is their peer network is very high. So the parents are now millennials and a little bit of Gen X. So paying attention to it, the biggest thing that we've discovered um, doing the research on them is YouTube is a huge influence. Um, parental supervision is still there with social media. Um, it's still a little too early to say, but I always like to point out Generation Z's kind of, again, when we're talking about next generation, it's quickly approaching. During the pandemic, this generation was actually the most number of gifts was coming from this generation. Now, not amount, um, that still was um, a combination of millennials and baby boomer, it was depending on which study you were seeing. Um, but, but it was actually the Gen Z was number of gifts. So very proud of that for them. Want to talk a little bit very quickly also about some other millennials I did some deep dives with Chris Bean, um, and his family do family planning on their philanthropy. They actually sat down and mapped out their next three years, even though they have small children, because I get asked, well, if someone has kids, does that mean they're not giving? And I say, that isn't always a barrier. It can be, um, but it doesn't also, also mean that him and his family and his well, his wife have decided to give $50,000 as part of the campaign for their alma mater up in uh, Indianapolis. To you, be honest, um, I met him through the Lilly School and some connections there. He sold his company off before he hit 40. Um, and, been, and now he's doing $500,000 a year to Muslim-based organizations. $500,000 a year, not $500,000, just a year. Um, Gabby Spat is in um, Atlanta, also involved with the, the Jewish community scene, and she does fundraising for her job, but is also doing philanthropy and, and trying to, I follow her on social media. She has a very strong social media presence, if you want to follow someone really interesting, and just doing a lot um, of things that impact her. Taylor Hearn is, and I met him was when he was the pitcher for the Texas Rangers, um, and he is just using his celebrity status to impact children. He's very um, passionate about those topics. Erin Feingold White, you heard me talk about her, the founder of BBB. She's actually taken a little bit of step away from that um, because she doesn't play Powderpuff anymore, but she's still engaged with them as the founder. And then also working for the math, she manages the foundation as well. So just using her influence as an employee, you know, getting to do philanthropy where she works and getting to engage with that. And Taylor Hansen, I wanna see if anybody knows who this is. This is like my my little, are you a millennial question? Angela, you want to help me with the chat? No one's responding. No one knows who Taylor Hansen is? They are. We got a oh, few. Coming They're up. coming in. There yeah. they go. There was just a little bit of a delay. Yep. Everybody seems to know Mbop. That's the it first one. It is. <laughs> and the Hansen Taylor. brother. Okay. Yeah. It's one of the Hanson brothers, singer of Umbop, but he's actually kept quite a celebrity in Australia and making quite a name for himself and money. But he is using his celebrity funds to do a food pantry in Tulsa where he, him, his wife, and his six children are living. And that is what he is doing with his funds, his philanthropic funds, is using his celebrity status and personal philanthropic dollars um, as a millennial. And so I always, and also he's, he's a celebrity, so it's kind of fun. Um, I met his executive director and the executive director um, helped me with some of this research as well. So um, pretty exciting. And as an elder millennial, I'm obsessed with Umbop. So pretty exciting. I think it's one of my first uh, cassettes. I think it's not the right thing. So anyway, just kind of a fun thing. So just some concluding thoughts. Um, think about your social media for your nonprofit. If you're a nonprofit um, board member, volunteer, executive today, what social media presence do you have? I say, you know, I get asked, should I be on everything? And the answer is no, you don't need to be on everything. Do one or two things and do it really well. Make it shareable. Do, do you need events that are focused on Millennials, yes, it doesn't necessarily need to be a happy hour. Everybody's like, I do these happy hours. And I'm like, no, that doesn't mean the case. I actually just gave a talk and they said, oh, we do all these events and they're at eight o'clock at night and they're always on school nights. And I'm like, that's not always friendly for people with children. Um, so you've got to mix it up a little bit. 
and maybe even survey your millennials on what they want and need. Um, face-to-face, millennials still want face-to-face. It's a very, every time I do this talk, I'm like, oh, right, I gotta remember that. <laughs> now, you still may need to text them to get the appointment, um, but they do wanna be asked face-to-face. Um, the biggest influencers is their friends. Um, you've got their friends will bring their friends and then then your table needs to be a little bigger because they'll bring all their friends. Um, global issues, local impact. Um, so keeping even if you're doing amazing global work, you've got to localize it to what they can think about. And then volunteer. They want to volunteer and the volunteerism will be tied in with their giving. Um, so keep that in mind. So um, I think we're at Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Seaworth. Great. Thank you so much. We have some questions prepared. As you can see, we can go ahead and, and um, drop the screen if you want, uh, okay. Holly, and then we can open up and actually, you know, get some questions from the group okay. and see what they're thinking. Sure. Love it. Because I know it's not a shy group of people. I've seen a lot of these names before. This is your one chance to ask about what's going on in your shop. It's a little bit like Vegas. What stays on the webinar is here and, until the person downloads it. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so um, how do we engage them to volunteer? That's one of the first questions that I had, right? We know volunteerism from all sorts of different research uh, attempts. We know that volunteerism is an antecedent to giving. If we get somebody coming in, and the way I like to teach it is we're trying to get them to say yes to our organization in as many ways as possible before we ask for the gift. So yes. what what makes it, um, what types of volunteerism are intriguing for this group? Because we know mm -hmm. that's also changed. So they want to volunteer for something that matters. And we also need to give them a finite job description. Um, we've noticed, and I'm I'm even seeing this with my day job, right? We've been engaging some council members. Again, this is kind of a board equivalent for us. Can you come in and do this project? This is when it starts. This is when it stops. Um, but it also gives them a little bit, a little bit of narcissistic behavior of you get to be chair of the committee. You get to be this or that. Um, it really does enable them to do stuff or they need to have specific ask. I have really gotten pushed back on. Don't put me in a room to be spoken to. I need to be, I need to, you know, provide advice. I need to, and guess what? They're, they have careers now. They have been highly educated, highly trained. So they can give advice back the, of people we don't need to hire staff for. Let them come and do work. I have a council member right now who's building us whole action plan on arts organization and because of her work is building us strategic plans for all of it i don't have to pay for it it's amazing so i have to keep up <laughs> but it's been really good but it's a finite role for a year we are seeing that in volunteerism across the board and you know as a few of you that have heard me talk over the last couple of years, I've been pointing out, we need to come together and work on increasing volunteerism throughout Texas. We are mm -hmm. lagging the national average for volunteerism. As generous as we are, as, as large of a, a geographic footprint as we have, we have a lot of folks that need help, but we're not um, engaging and volunteering at the same level, just even as the average around the rest of the country. So mm -hmm. any ideas around this would be helpful, things that are working for your organizations. Um, but we we know that post COVID, we have a lot of volunteers that are nonprofits were relying on boomers. Meals on Wheels is one of my favorite examples to use. So they, they had time to, to go out and they enjoyed visiting with people. But when we said, wait, you're in you know, you're in a protected class, you could become ill. They said, okay, I'm done volunteering. And they didn't come back to that, right? They said, it's time for the next generation. But younger generations are looking for more episodic volunteerism, right? Yeah. What can I come in and do something for one day a month or, you know, not looking at the long-term commitment. And we, I think with also the volunteerism, we were doing a season of like, well, this, this group always did a hundred hours a month and, and we've got most families now have especially dual our dual income and they're also doing the sandwich generation where they're caregiver for above them and below them as well so that's harder mm -hmm. uh, we do have a comment um from susan that um 
she, I guess she's with a large company, making sure I'm understanding this, Susan, that your organization's letting you volunteer on Fridays and your daughter's company's doing it as well? Okay, her daughter's company is doing it. Okay. So, and that's something that early on, my first job was in corporate public affairs. And part of what I did was manage volunteerism where we could allow people to, to volunteer during the week. So that's a long time ago, guys. That's like over 20 years ago. And the the employees were very excited about it. They look forward to the pen pal program. They look forward to knowing what opportunities they had, but they even then there were very finite opportunities. Um. We have another question. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about like young professionals and emerging leaders groups for the younger millennial? Are those successful? Do we have any key learnings around it? So we've seen some nationally that have done well, but then they only will last really well for a few years. You either have to put dedicated staff around it. Um, I know the DSO has done a pretty good job around Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Um, I've seen a couple nationally that have done some up in New York or LA. They tend to be major market ones that have done really well. Um, but they tend to, but all these major markets tend to be transient markets. Millennials tend to move a lot. So you may this is the thing you need to be careful about saying, well, this is a four-year assignment. This is a three-year assignment um, because people will come and go. They're either build, going up the corporate ladder, trying to get partner, going through residency, whatever the thing is, um, mixed in with they're moving a lot. Um, so that's always been when I, when I would try to do these interviews of, well, how is your YP group doing? Well, it was really good for about four years and then it fizzled. It was really good for about three years and then it fizzled because they would have a leader that either moved or, you know, got distracted by something. So we're, you have to remember, these are still emerging adults. There's a reason why that they're coming of age. Um, and so it's, but I think they're not in vain. It's just, you have to recognize for what it is. Um, and be prepared to do with it what you will. The other thing though, is if you don't, if you keep separating them out, I mean, I have a, I have a pretty strong personal opinion about it. If you keep separating them out, they will be and treat them like a thousand dollar donor. They will give you thousand dollar gifts. We have some that are really ready to give major gifts. So if you don't put them at the seat at the table, they will not be giving it to, to you because you're not treating them like it. So so we see that a uh, few comments, things that are working is making sure that you get feedback. Uh, also making sure that when people come in to volunteer, for example, and um, whether it's young professional or not, um, is there a few things they're looking for some, some amount of fluidity, but consistency, some way for them to continue engaging a way to, um, for them to not only give feedback, but to feel that they're involved and understand the impact of their work, right? Yeah. Just is like a donation. Yeah. So following up on that, right? What we know about retention and giving is that um, individuals are much more likely to give, like 96% are more likely to give. Again, if we do a simple follow-up with a thank you, and it's a very simple explanation of how that gift made a difference. So same thing with our volunteers, not just thanks for showing up today, but hey, because of what we did, our volunteers in the last month were able to create this much change or during yeah. your shift, we created this much. Um, I know the food banks always has a an easy way of doing that at the end of every shift, talking about how many pounds of food the, the people have packed. Um, some of us have uh, jobs where it's a little more difficult to measure that, but having that impact story is important. Um, there were a couple other elements here. Uh, one is a specific question about um, a state association trying to engage millennials in school boards uh, because the school boards tend to still be Gen X and baby boomers. That's not inconsistent with my research with um, board governance in general. Um, mm -hmm. So this is kind of where our, our dissertations blend with that question because I'm looking at diversity on um, boards, which included age. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's fairly common, but they're asking how can we engage them more? And these meetings are often in the evenings. So what, how do we engage millennials in the evenings as well? Well, I don't know about school boards. I haven't studied that at all. Um, and my school board happens to be mostly millennials, which is interesting. Um, so I, 
I don't know. I guess I haven't been intrigued by that question because I don't know. But I also think my market for my school board is the average age is 35. That's the case study that we cut out. Um, so because it was a the city that I live in by chance. Um, but how do we engage them one more time? How do we engage them in politics or how do we engage them in just in in evening events. So even it may not need, be evening events. Maybe the magical time we've been we've been playing around with things because we're the arts. We do two hundred fifty events here. We've been playing around with four thirty because that's early enough to do an hour, and then they could do pickup time a different way. Um, it seems to work, but again, every market is slightly different. So I can't answer for Col Denver, Colorado, or New Orleans. Um, but it's also testing your events and also we're post pandemic. And so everything's a little different with events, I think nationally. So how do we uh, bring audiences back? That's just a bringing audiences back conversation. That's a whole other interest I have for some other research yeah. for <laughs> that I did at Arnova. So, well, I think understanding our audience has always got to be where we start because, yeah. you know, because what we do with philanthropy it's messy because people are involved that's why it's not so clear or cut and easy yeah. and knowing what to do we have to understand our audience um yeah. you can be in the same it, city different subsectors and have traffic patterns different... i was like because you may have traffic patterns and uh, i don't know where everybody's coming from the call because you have traffic patterns right i have a donor visit with a millennial and i have to go to downtown dallas we're in northern work like an hour away so i have to give myself an hour today so every everything is different so i can't answer fully that answer so yeah, so we just I, that's where we can always give guidance as a starting point. Make sure you understand that audience. The other question we have um, that's been submitted is, what does nonprofit effectiveness, you know, how does that um, and programming effectiveness play into millennials' decisions for giving and volunteering? So they... It's it's really important. It's really critical. It, this boils down to even the events. They want the money. They want efficiency because this is why they have distrust in government. They have distrust in large institutions because it's this feeling, whether it's justified or not, I'm not here to justify anything. It's the perceptions that millennials as a whole have. So how can we provide the transparency that they are looking for? Um, the, I... I almost would rename the millennials the fallout generation. There's so many events that happen as they're coming of age that it created this distrust. So when they want program effectiveness, what can you do through your annual report or conversations or as you're asking them to volunteer that they, their time is valuable um, because they're doing caregiving, whatever that means for them. They're trying to build careers. Um, and you need to show that your program is valuable and not wasting time or money. You know, and I think that ties in a little bit to the life cycle argument for for dealing with primary prospects, um, because regardless of what generation, when we're in that 30 to 45 stage, we're all juggling a lot. And I think we have some best practices that are are commonly covered in fundraising, you know, fundraising conferences and things about uh, asking people, how do you like to be engaged? I know you're really busy now. What works well for you right now? Uh, mm -hmm. Recognizing, you know, their current situation, if they've got, you know, a lot of kids or if they're they're in the sandwich generation. Um, but being able to to say, how do you prefer we speak to you? You know, do you like getting our, our newsletters? Do you prefer I text or call? And that actually, you know, because they'll tell you that and we can put it in our database so people know. Uh, and the same thing, I, I'm one of the, those that says, oh, don't send me 30 solicitations a year. We're going to give around November. So, you know, like Just send me any person. I, I don't care they what generation. That. Yeah. I don't care what generation. Just ask. Right. And I think that's where the face to face, because they were seeing their parents get asked face to face, which they saw as a sign of respect. Why did you do that? To, why didn't you do that for me? You know, so. So we have one person who specifically asked about you know, do millennials appreciate a phone call? You know, do they like to have a brief conversation where you call and say, hey, they won't answer the phone. Me. That's the problem. Yeah. So we have all these firms. I'm sorry, somebody's with one of these firms on the phone. They will text though. They will text. This is a big thing. So especially the elder, I'm going to answer on the elder side for a second, which has a little bit more of the disposable income. Um, they will text. So they, I have gift officers who go, 
this one has a high well screen and they won't respond. I go, did you text them? Cause I have staff and they go, did you text them? I literally just had to take care of something right before our call to take care of something who's super high up at a tech company. And he texts me back and he's a millennial. He is 34. And I'm like, and he responded right away. Does he email me back? No. So does he answer the phone? No. He texts me back. This is just a pattern. Now, again, I'm always going to answer in generalizations. You always can find the one. I'm a phone person, but that's part of my job. You can always catch me on the phone. But it is not, it, it is so much easier to get text, social media, messenger, which is also a funny thing I've noticed as a trend. Um it's just a pattern, at least right now. It may, will it change? You may invite me back in five years and I'm like, oh, they'll answer the phone. You know, it may change. So, we'll, see. well, we also have a comment, like not too many surveys. And I, I have to admit, I'm, I am agreeing with that. I have the example, and if you guys are seeing the text, it's like you pick up a prescription, you have a survey, you get an oil change, you have a survey, you know, <laughs> and if you make a gift, was it easy to give to us? You know, we, I think we have to make, because we know that data analytics, which I love, um, you know, I'm not saying that it shouldn't have a role. Absolutely. We should use that as much as possible to, in development to help us personalize our work and be more efficient. But knowing that the whole world is really embracing analytics and we are asked, getting asked to do multiple surveys a week, you know, how can we in nonprofit make it easier for people to engage with us? We don't want people to say they I made a gift, so now they asked me to fill out a survey and come to a focus group, or I volunteered, and before I leave, I have to fill out my my survey. Like, but how can we think of ways maybe to get positive, or well, get feedback in a positive way, so people don't feel like we're asking them to do work or burning them out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, any last questions? We've got oh, some more things are coming here. Um. So when it comes to marketing materials for millennials, what would you suggest? Keep it concise and show their gift impact? That's yes. a question. And always Audrey. add a QR code. They actually will respond to direct mail. Um, but so what will happen is you can mail them direct mail. They'll read it. Keep it concise. Keep it message driven, mission driven, impact driven. Don't incentivize them. They won't respond. Um, but then put a QR code and a web link. So they won't reply to the, you know, the BRE but they will, they will click it and then respond. That is a very big trend. So, but the, but they like mail because they don't get much mail and then formal invites. So if you've got an event, don't email it to them. It's too cluttered. Everybody started mailing, emailing during the pandemic. So now everybody's bombarding them. They, they unsubscribe to you, but mail them in formal invite. They feel special. It's that personalization we talked about. Um, they want to, they may text you for a response. <laughs> So um, make it easy. So think about that or QR um, RSVP. So these are the things that are little tricks that, you know, shifting behavior um, and they love experiences. So it, it's interesting. I say they don't like galas, but they still like an experience. So how do you, you know, you know, water wells. When I was talking about paper for water. One of the best events I ever been to is learning what it means to have to go um, two miles to get water. And we had to go experience moving the water and being part of that. And we got to have a very casual event. So picking up the jugs and going there and like, oh, this is what it means. And I got to fold the origami. I'm still not very good at it, but um, so those are the kind of things we want to keep uh, encouraging you to think about. How can you make an experience, make it mission driven? And um, I know you'll do great work. There's 75 million of us. So, so many. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen just quickly for folks that um, may want to see the upcoming dates. I hope you're seeing the the slideshow here where we had some questions and also um, our upcoming webinars. We will be back this fall with three more. You just a reminder, um, you use we've got the QR code there. Look at us. Way to go, Alyssa. Uh, that you can always use that to find about our upcoming events. And you can access this, at least, it usually takes a day or two, but we will put this on our research page. So um, you can refer back to this, or if you want to share it with people, uh, aka, you know, your vice president uh, development or you know, other team members that need to hear this message that weren't here with us today. Um, and just know that 
Uh, and that link to reach it is at the bottom of the slide that we have up now to view our past webinars. So, you know, we've got all of our, our past ones on there, but our center's, you know, really committed to, to being here uh, and strengthening the nonprofit sector, helping you do your jobs better. So reach out to us in any way. I put my personal contact in there. We've also, you know, have the uh, any way to reach us through our website, as well as our socials, as we have Alyssa doing a lot of our social for us. So thank you again. I um, really want to you know, thank Holly for taking time to be with us today and all of you. So we look forward to seeing you um, hopefully this fall and reach out to us in between now and then if, if you can. We're just wrapping up the semester. So if you need anything, we'll be around this summer uh, ready to support you. Thank you for having me. And here's the book if you need it. So, yes, and we have a picture of the book in in this uh, slide deck. So make sure that you know you can go to that. Thank you. All right. Bye. So thank you so much, Holly. We appreciate it.